This video is sponsored by Incognate. Emerald green mountains, cascading waterfalls, and pristine beaches adorned with golden sands. These are just a few of the things often said about the tropical islands of Hawaii. But these lands are also filled with dark mystery and intrigue, with more than 100 people still missing from the island to this very day. When Japanese tourist Musubi Watanabe returned to paradise, she had no idea that she had joined this number, or come face to face with the heartless killer who, to this day, still refuses to accept his deplorable actions. But no matter what this man says, the evidence against him is impossible to ignore. Today, we're diving into the world of Kirk Langford his encounter with Masumi Watanabe, and how this man received the longest second-degree murder sentence in Hawaiian history. Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at the case of Masumi Watanabe. Now, sometimes a body is not required to convict someone over murder, and as you'll see in this story, there was enough evidence to take Kirk down. By the way, if you like coffee, then I have a surprise for you at the end of this video. Before we begin, today's video is sponsored by Incogni. Many of you will know of Incogni by now, and I wanted to remind you of the importance of online safety. Incogni does a fantastic job of protecting your identity online by removing all of your data from the market. It reaches out to data brokers on your behalf and requests all of your data to be removed. They'll even handle any obligations for you. Remember that every time you subscribe to a newsletter or sign up to a new website, you typically have to accept a terms of service. And by accepting the site policy, you may be giving consent for your data to be sold and resold by hundreds of data brokers. Many of these data companies retain personal information like your name, gender, online name, shopping habits, and even your address. And all of this can lead to impersonation, fraud, and, of course, stolen identity. But if you sign up to Incogni with my unique code, CRIME, create an account and grant them the right to work for you, their automated system will contact data brokers on your behalf and request your data to be removed. You can even see the type of data broker and their risk factor. So far, Incogni has currently removed 65 threats identified with my email address and still actively searches to remove more. Protect your online privacy today. Incogni's offering 60% off to the first 100 people who sign up using my unique code CRIME below. I'll go ahead and leave that in the description and the pinned comment. Thank you to Incogni for sponsoring today's video, and thank you to you folks for supporting us content creators. Right folks, let's get straight into this one. Please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Masumi Watanabe. Aloha, and welcome to Hawaii, folks. Now, this island paradise remains one of the top tourist destinations in the world and it's quite obvious to see why. With stunning beaches, glorious seas, and incredible mountains, there is something for everyone here. Polynesians first settled here around 1500 years ago, and thankfully, this fact is rarely glossed over in our modern day age. The history, heritage, and origin of the island's early inhabitants are still celebrated to this day, and many of their traditions and customs are still thriving here. And the result, a beautiful blend of the comforts of the modern day age, melded with the special and unique recollection of a long-lasting way of life. This truly is the best of both worlds. Hawaii has its own distinct vibe too, a general sense of laid-back friendliness that permeates every aspect of living. Tourists are attracted by the millions here, and those who enjoy catching the waves will know that Hawaii is one of the best places in the world for surfing. Polynesians are reported to be catching waves as far back as the 12th century here, and to be honest, it all makes sense. I mean, if you live somewhere with waves this good, you'd be daft not to. With the likes of Kona Coffee, Lanakai Beach, and Jack Johnson, Hawaii is home to many great things. I could go on about this place for days, and it's somewhere that I'd love to visit again as an adult. Saying that, like all other places, there is a dark side to Hawaii too, and this case proves to be a cold shadow in its morbid history. Before we find ourselves in Hawaii though, we must first travel 4,000 miles northwest to the Japanese island of Sado, a small yet scenic island just off the mainland of Honshu. And it's here, in this other corner of paradise, that we could find the life of Masumi Watanabe. Masumi was born here to her parents Hideichi and Fumiko. She was the family's youngest child, with her two older brothers, Kenya and Ryo, completing the family lineup. She grew up in a happy home, surrounded by both love and familial support. She did well in school, 
got good grades, and generally stayed out of trouble. Safe to say that life was calm. With a population of just over 50,000 residents, Sado Island's way of life is quite similar to that of Hawaii. That being laid back and relatively carefree, or at least in comparison to Japanese standards. Misumi was the type of person to always seek more answers, which even extended into her own identity. And although she wasn't yet sure who she wanted to become, she wasn't scared to go ahead and find out. At the young age of 20, and after travelling to Hawaii for the first time with her family, Misumi fell in love with the place. Something just seemed to resonate here with her, on a very intense level. For this reason, she planned a solo trip back to Hawaii the very next year in the year 2007. And although her parents were initially reluctant to let her go, they saw how much this meant to her. And so, they made a special agreement with their daughter. She was allowed to travel alone on one condition, that condition being that she stayed with family friends already on the island. Misumi agreed to their condition, and so, at the young age of 21, she packed her bags, waved goodbye, and boarded her flight to Hawaii. Misumi planned to stay here for around about two months, and was determined to use her time well. She wanted to improve her spoken English, and also intended to volunteer and help out at the Sunset Beach Elementary School, which could be found nearby on the island of Oahu. Between volunteering and improving her English, Misumi flexed her artistic abilities by drawing much of her surroundings in her sketchbooks. And, these activities aside, she also planned to pass her time by listening to music and reading. Despite her English still needing some polishing, Misumi felt at home in Hawaii. Standing at only 5 feet tall and weighing only 100 pounds, she was quite a petite lady. She also suffered from myopia and astigmatism, meaning that she had to wear special prescription glasses. So, it's safe to say that Misumi was quite a delicate woman, and potentially an easy target. But despite this, she felt both comfortable and unafraid on the island. As the weeks ticked by here, her existence became one of calmness. She spread her free time between volunteering at the school and inhaling every resource that the local library offered. As part of her regular daily routine, Musumi was dropped off a short distance away from her home and walked along Pupukea Road. At the time, she was staying with Yumi Miura and her husband, who both happened to be family friends. This couple lived at the top of Pupukea Road, with an additional half mile of track to their front door. With only a couple of weeks left on the island, Musumi was nearing the very end of her holiday. And although she was happy to be heading home to her family, there was no doubt that she was going to miss Hawaii. Before that moment arrived though, she still had some time left here. It's that bittersweet moment of the holiday that we all feel towards the end. The date was April the 12th, 2007, and the time was around 9.30am. One of Misumi's friends dropped her off at the bottom of Pupukea Road, and as always, Misumi took this chance to walk the rest of the way back home. The area was not particularly remote or rural, so Misumi had nothing to worry about. But as the time passed, and Misumi failed to arrive home, her host family started to become concerned. Yumi and her husband left the property to go and find Misumi, but after searching all around Pupukea Road and finding no sign, they became increasingly anxious. Sensing that something was wrong, the couple decided to call the authorities to let them know that she was missing. After all, by now, she'd been MIA for over two hours. As the hours passed by, it felt like the appropriate time to inform her parents back home in Japan. By now, news was spreading all across the island, so it was only fair that they knew too. Locals were soon searching both high and low for Misumi. Her small frame and lack of English would make her stand out quite easily, but also, in contrast, made her quite vulnerable. The police began their investigation at the house that Misumi was staying in. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but they did take the opportunity while they were there to collect DNA samples. There were no noteworthy observations in her room, and there were no indicative signs as to why she would decide to run away. To add to that, her luggage was already sitting out and ready to be packed, and her return ticket back home had already been printed. As the news of her disappearance spread, multiple people came forward to share any information which may help locate Misumi, and a statement made by one of those people would prove to be extremely important. An eyewitness came forward to say that, on the morning that Misumi had disappeared, she had spotted a young woman who matched the physical description of her being persuaded into a truck by a man. It appeared to the witness that the girl was reluctant, apparently said no multiple times to the driver, and seemed to struggle against him. And although the only detail they could remember was that 
that the truck was white, this was a pivotal moment in the investigation. While the authorities began to scour the area for white trucks, investigators got to work on the island's vehicle database. And that is when a second witness came forward with an almost identical story. However, this witness could provide one additional detail. They noticed that that white truck had a company logo printed on the chassis. And thankfully, they could even remember the company's name, that being Holy Termite and Pest Control. Now, this massively helped narrow down their search operation. The authorities believe that anyone who is capable of kidnapping must have previous run-ins with the law. And after crashing the data between the names of all pest control technicians and those who have had previous convictions, they finally had a name. So. This is where I must introduce you to a man named Kirk Lankford, a technician who worked for Holy Termite and Pest Control at the time Masumi disappeared. Born in the year 1985, Kirk was raised in Kalihi on the island of Oahu, and although he did have a clean criminal record as an adult, some juvenile charges remained which scarred his profile. According to the neighbours, the Lankford family had moved into the area around 18 months prior and were generally regarded as good people. Described as agreeable and known to be a church-going family, Kirk and his pregnant partner Corinne had no issues in the neighbourhood. From the outside, they were seeming to settle down. They already had one baby boy with them, and were expecting their second child in the coming months. Kirk was described as pleasant, lovely, and known for hosting Bible studies at his house. And these charitable efforts portrayed him as a man who was not just your average citizen. The family would attend the Potter's House Church regularly, and others attending the church also spoke very highly of them, where Kirk was described as being honest, upright, and faithful. And so, when these rumours began to spread, many refused to believe that Kirk was the man in the truck. They were not the only ones to refute it either. Kirk was adamant that he knew nothing about Masumi's disappearance, and furthermore, that he was not involved. However, he did admit that he was in the area when Masumi disappeared, and that, in addition to this, he was also driving the company's truck at the time. But Kirk chalked this up to a lousy coincidence, and insisted that the two witnesses must have got their stories wrong. With no other evidence to work with, officers eventually had to let him go. They left their details with him, and asked him to call if he remembered anything else in the coming days. Curiously though, as they were leaving, they noticed that he owned another the white truck, that being a Ford F-150. By now, the authorities had combed through Masumi's items to help build a DNA profile, this including her toothbrush, brush, and an extra pair of glasses. As the hours turned into days, it became more and more obvious that Harm may have found Masumi in one way or another, and the likelihood of her just walking away was extremely small. But then, all of a sudden, police received a tip. A homeless man reported that, while walking in the Kahana Bay area, he saw another man digging into the ground, and this man had a white van. When he confronted the guy and asked him what he was up to, he said that he was looking for a lost necklace. But this seemed rather suspicious to the homeless man, so he wrote down the license plate number. And no surprise, this license plate would eventually lead back to a white Ford F-150 that was owned by Kirk Langford. So, now we have two reports of Kirk's service truck abducting Misumi, and a further report of him using his personal truck to dig into the ground. It doesn't take a genius to see how dodgy this looks. Although two testimonies were insufficient to rationalise a search warrant, Kirk had some outstanding warrants for previous traffic offences. And so, equipped with this information, it gave the local police enough reason to take both trucks in and thoroughly examine them. They also brought Kirk in for an interview, but interestingly enough, he refused to cooperate with detectives, demanding a lawyer instead. It should be noted here that pleading the fifth or invoking your right to silence is both legal and probably sensible in most cases. But nevertheless, in this story, it still looked a little more than dodgy. In addition to this, he would also fail a polygraph or lie detector test, though this has no legal standing, and isn't considered to be admissible in court. Now, detectives knew that their best chance at charging Kirk would be a positive match through cross-examination of his trucks and Masumi's belongings. But with such a long turnaround with DNA sampling, all they could do for now was let him go. 
But eventually, the authorities came across more than they had bargained for, because inside the work truck, investigators also found a pair of glasses in the footwell and bloodstains on the upholstery. And after several days of waiting, their DNA samples would come back with resounding results. Forensic analysis confirmed that the blood found in the truck belonged to Masumi Watanabe, and that furthermore, the glasses found in the footwell were the exact prescription she had. It was at this moment that the police confirmed that they were now treating Masumi's case as murder instead of a missing person. On that very day, and after 14 days of her missing, Kirk Langford was arrested and charged with murder in the second degree. You know, it's funny how people seem to change their stories despite also claiming that they have nothing to hide. And in this case, Kirk is no different. Now officially under interrogation, Kirk suddenly admitted that he had in fact seen Masumi on the day she disappeared. You see, apparently, he had hit her by accident while driving down Pupukea Road, and seeing that she had minor injuries, he offered to take her to the hospital, to which she allegedly agreed. But after agreeing to get into his truck, allegedly, she then apparently decided to jump out of his truck while it was going at a speed of over 40 miles per hour. That is when she hit her head, which apparently explains the blood. I'm sorry, but is anyone actually buying this story? Kirk put her irrational actions down to confusion and a lack of communication between them, blaming her poor English in the process. Kirk then admitted that her apparent jump was fatal. Realising that she was dead, he stashed her remains in the back of his truck instead of informing the authorities. He then continued with work for the rest of the day, with her body still in the vehicle. When the day was over, he attempted to clean up the truck before then going home, having dinner with his wife and child, and then going to a shop to purchase tools and supplies. During this final activity, he was spotted by surveillance cameras located at two separate stores, buying various items such as gloves, a shovel, bleach-based cleaner, and rubble bags. He then wrapped up her body, transferred her from the company truck to his own personal one, and then drove to a rural area. This is where the third witness saw him digging for a necklace, when, in reality, he was actually digging a grave. After being caught in the act, Kirk panicked. So, instead of burying Masumi's body as originally planned, he instead apparently pushed her out into the ocean instead. He also claimed that the reason he initially lied to the police was because he was worried about losing his job. When investigators spoke to his partner, Corinne stated that Kirk had left after dinner to do a side job, and when he returned home, she noticed that mud was splattered on his clothes. Interestingly enough, this part of her statement was retracted later on in the process. After this information, investigators would later return to the initial grave site, but after thoroughly digging the entire area, they would unfortunately come back empty-handed. Kirk was correct in claiming that he had abandoned the idea of burying her body here, and sadly, Masumi Watanabe has never been found even to this day. Now, despite her body never being found, there was plenty of evidence to build a case against Kirk Langford. This includes testimonies from multiple witnesses, positive DNA matches between Masumi's belongings and the trucks, and even parts of Kirk's own testimony. And so, on this basis, the prosecution decided to charge him with murder. It is worth mentioning here that, without any signs of premeditation, it was not possible to charge him with murder in the first degree, or at least not without the high risk of him being found not guilty, and so, murder in the second degree was selected instead. On March the 4th, 2008, which happened to be just under one year after Masumi's disappearance and and murder, Kirk Langford's trial officially began. As a matter of self-preservation, Kirk stuck to his second story in court, reciting that the entire event was just an accident, that she decided to jump out of the speeding vehicle on her own accord, and that she had died by accident. Kirk remained adamant that he was not responsible for her death, which I guess is okay in his own little fantasy land, but as for the rest of the courtroom, they all believed he was guilty. Well, almost all of them, not everyone though. You see, Kirk's parents were present in the courtroom, and both of them believed he was a gentle soul who was not capable of murder. Despite the overwhelming evidence at hand, they would also throw further shade back at the prosecution by claiming that Kirk was now some sort of victim to some underground police conspiracy. Well, at least we now know where he got his intelligence from, or lack thereof. 
The fact that Kirk never surrendered himself or brought forward any information regarding Masumi's death to the police does say it all, really. I mean, he already had one foot firmly in the grave, but he practically sealed his fate after lying to the officers. Although the prosecution does not believe he had pre-planned her abduction or murder, they also refused to accept Kirk's own version of events that day. Crash experts testified that if he had hit her with his car in the way that he claimed, then his vehicle would have been damaged in the process. However, even after examining the truck, no signs of relatable damage were observed when compared to his testimony. To add to this, Masumi would have also sustained much heavier injuries when compared to the ones that he claimed. As you can see, his entire story just simply does not add up to reality. I thought this part was quite interesting, but investigators, the local authorities, and Masumi's family all believe that Kirk did not put her body in the ocean, and instead, they all think that she was buried somewhere in the local area. But Kirk remains adamant that he placed her body into the ocean. In court, he said, The only other thing I could think to do was to place her body in the ocean. I thought that perhaps that would hopefully be as peaceful as burying her near the water. However, the prosecution does not believe this to be the case. Given Oahu's tides and similar cases they have historically dealt with, her body would have very likely eventually washed back up on shore. Kirk further testified, I took her body. I put it in the compartment, I put it back into my personal truck, I put her inside of a bag, and I taped up the bag. Without a body, it wasn't easy for the prosecution to determine how much Misumi may have suffered. Of course, a more depraved way of killing a victim will usually find a longer sentence. It was speculated that, horrifyingly, Misumi may have been sexually assaulted before being tortured or suffocated in the bag. Hideyuchi and Fumiko Watanabe attended the trial with the support of a translator. At one point in the proceedings, Kirk addressed them directly to say, I did not do that to your daughter. I hope you know that she did not suffer. I did not torture your daughter." But Masumi's parents, much in the same way as the authorities, did not believe that Kirk was telling the truth. Her father said, "'It haunts me every day because I can hear Masumi calling for us to take her home. Her cries are incessant in my ear.'" Addressing him head on, her mother Fumiko said, "'We will know no peace until we can take our beloved daughter back to our family and give her a decent burial in Japan.'" After all of the evidence was considered, it only took a day and a half for the jury to reach their verdict. In the end, Kirk Langford was found guilty of murder in the second degree, and therefore was given a life sentence. This is where his sentencing gets rather interesting though. Despite Kirk avoiding the harshest punishment available, that being life without parole, this would eventually backfire on him. Receiving life with the possibility of parole, it was actually up to the judge to determine how long that term before parole would be. And let me tell you, he did not go gently on Kirk. Kirk was ordered to spend 150 years behind bars before being eligible for parole making it one of the longest sentences ever handed down in Hawaiian history. So I guess we'll be seeing you in the year 2158, Kirk. Good luck. But there were complications several years later. Since Kirk's sentence was over triple the guideline maximum, and the jury never filed a letter of justification, it was argued that this was potentially unfair. Luckily though, that motion was ultimately denied, as was Kirk's own personal appeal. And so, with that in mind, hopefully he'll spend the rest of his days behind bars. Words can't describe the pain felt by Masumi's family and loved ones. The loss of a child has to be one of the most devastating feelings in the world. Add murder to the mix, and a body that has never been found. Well, we can only imagine how heart-wrenching that must be for Hideyuchi and for Miko. Masumi was a shy, introverted, and kind young woman who was still finding her way in life at the tender age of 21. Something about the Hawaiian Islands clearly resonated with her. I mean, we all have that special place that compels us. And for Masumi, it was Hawaii. And it's a tragedy that, amid her personal paradise, she found such a vile, horrible creature. What truly happened to Masumi on her final day in this world is only known by one man. And for reasons known only to himself, he still sticks to his fanatical story. Maybe one day, when he decides to stand up with courage and decency, we will know what happened to Masumi. But for now, as a consequence of his own inability to face the monster in the mirror, her family must live with despair. All Masumi's family want is closure. They cannot take back the awful actions inflicted on their daughter. All they ask is for Kirk to reveal the location of her remains, 
so that they can finally bring their daughter back home. I found this comment to be both gentle and fitting to end the video on, but after a sentencing, Misumi's mother said the following, Even after all of this, we still bow humbly to you, to beg and plead to show us some way that we can return her remains home. Let's hope that one day, he finally does. You know, part of me wonders if Kirk has lied to himself so much that he now actually believes it to be true. And there is an actual term for this known as the illusory truth effect. But I still can't believe how bad Misumi's parents must be feeling. And all of this is just perpetuated because this man won't look at himself in the mirror. Let's hope that he does eventually spill the beans. But at least for now, I have to wrap this case up here, folks. Before you go though, what are your thoughts to this case? What do you think Kirk's motive was? And what do you think he did with the body? Do you think it's still underground, or do you think it was actually sent into the ocean? As always, please share your thoughts in the comment section down below. I do honestly try to read all of them, and I really appreciate your time. If you want to support me in the channel, then please check out my Patreon, or alternatively, check out my social media profiles to catch me and Nero on our adventures. So, as many of you know, I launched Classified Coffee with the Blackout Blend, which is a dark roast but also said that, eventually, I'll do more roasts. And today, I'm happy to share that I do in fact have another one. Do you wanna see? Now, I haven't actually seen it yet because the package only just arrived about 20 minutes ago while I was recording. So I thought maybe I'd open this on camera and see what we have. Okay. Right, so let's take a look. So this is a medium blend. It's known as the Espionage Blend. I thought it was pretty smart. Blackout, dark, espionage, both sides. Who knows what the light blend will be if that ever arrives. But um, yeah, let's take a look. Have you ever tried unboxing in front of a camera? It's, it's a bit awkward. I mean, at least it's not undressing. Okay, so here we have paper. the espionage blend. So that means now we have the blackout blend and also the espionage blend, depending on your flavor. The espionage blend is a medium roast and is both vibrant and fruity. So if you did like the blackout blend, but want a little more flavor, then this is your one. How good does this look, by the way? It looks absolutely awesome. I love it. And yeah, I think that's pretty much the end of the video, folks. Thank you so much for watching again. And as always, I'll see you again very soon for another one. Until that moment arrives though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.